Uh, but thank you for choosing to join in. Uh, I want you to look at a, a psalm, either while you read or while you watch here today, or maybe after you, you stop watching. We will try not to take too much time here. But uh, Psalm 34 is a neat, uh, neat psalm uh, because of what it says, certainly, coming from the pen of, of David that we are, or at least are pretty confident that it did, um, but also because of its setting in David's life. And as we think about this idea that we mentioned yesterday, if we're in battle with Satan, we're fighting his forces, uh, we're fighting for our soul, the souls of other people that we love, uh, we have to communicate to God. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand strong, that you can withstand Satan. In Ephesians 6, verse 18, Paul says, uh, praying at all times in the Spirit. And so there's this emphasis on communicating and praying to God as we battle, as we fight. Now, what's cool about Psalm 34 is David has just fled and just been released from an enemy. Okay? Now, uh, this goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And you can pick up and begin reading in verse 10. And read all the way through 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. It'll give you the context, the broader context. Uh, but the inscription in Psalm 34 tells us uh, what David has to do. Okay? So look at the inscription. Now, the inscription's not inspired necessarily. Okay? We don't, we're, we're certain it's not in the original. Uh, but it also is as old as any manuscript that we have. And so we're, we're fairly confident uh, that it's accurate. And at least uh, the early church and early Jews even or later Jews, I guess you'd say, uh, thought these were accurate, and so they preserved them. Uh, so notice the inscription in Psalm 34 of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Okay, so now what's happening? David's running from Saul, king of Israel. Saul's been, or David's been chosen by God to replace Saul. Saul's not happy about that. It's caused this struggle. David is blessed by God. Saul is not. Uh, there's a lot of tension. Uh, so much so that Saul wants to kill David. So David's running from Saul. He's running from an enemy. He's fighting an enemy. Even though he's not actively fighting him, he's in this struggle with an enemy. Then he ends up at the palace of the king of Gath. Okay, And uh, he's called Abimelech here, which is probably a title. But um, he's, he's at the, the palace of the king of, of Gath. Now, that's interesting because Goliath was from Gath. Okay, Now, when he gets there, some of the king's servants think they recognize David as this heroic king to be of the Jews. Maybe, they don't say this, but maybe they recognize him as the guy who took down our mighty giant. We don't know that because the text doesn't say it. But it's interesting to at least consider that. But because David hears, overhears these servants talking and thinks they may be on to him, he begins to act insane. He begins to scratch the door and claw the door. He begins to, to let spittle drool all into his beard and just get caught there. And so the king says, are you, are you sure there's no way this can be David? This is a crazy, crazy man. Look, he's insane. And he even says, don't I have enough crazy around here? Why do I need one more guy who's going to, to make life miserable around here? So they kick him out to send him on his way. And David uses uh, the, the, the Philistines, or those from Gath here, he uses them as a way to have some temporary shelter and escape from Saul, but then he doesn't end up getting captured by them. He's able to move on from them and hide out in a cave. And so the Lord delivers delivers David from... Um, I think I read most of that, Wes. Um, I'm a little at a little distance. It's tough for me to read those things. Um, so I think Wes suggested he was carrying the, the sword... Of Goliath, which is a cool side note, funny side note. Um, so he's he's anyway. The Lord has helped David escape. He's gone to this enemy. Uh, he's got a little bit of a temporary protection from Saul by way of this enemy, but then he's able to be delivered from the enemy and not risk being executed or captured by them, and find safety in a cave. And they come and help him. So it's that backdrop that he writes this psalm. And we won't spend time reading and studying the psalm in particular, other than to, to show what David says to do and what he does first. First few verses, one through seven, what did he do? And then the latter verses tell us or tell those he was teaching what to do. What's cool about this psalm too is that it's an acrostic, okay? 
it takes so the Hebrew alphabet and writes one line per letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, this one actually does 21 out of 22. I'm not sure what happened to that 22nd. But um, what's cool about acrostics in Hebrew culture is they were likely used to help teach uh, growing young boys as they were coming up and growing and learning not only the language, but learning uh, the laws of God and the teachings of God. And so they would use the, this approach Give them a psalm like Psalm 34 or 119 or Proverbs 31. And they would use that to teach the language and to teach the, the will of God. And so uh, it's a cool thing to think about. What is it that's special about the psalm that would cause them to know and to need to know these things? And so as we fight our battles, as we face our distresses like David did, we would do well to lean on psalms like this to help us in, the, in that distress. Notice how he starts. I will extol the Lord at all times. Extol the Lord at all times. I'll bless and praise the Lord. At all times. Isn't that the same terminology that Psalm uses, or that Saul, excuse me, that Paul uses in Ephesians 6, praying at all times in the Spirit? David says, Here I am on the run, can't find a place to stay, can't find a person on my side, and I will extol and praise the Lord at all times. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast of the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. So he says, I called out, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me, he delivered me. What a, what a powerful reminder and comfort. David says, look at my life to see that the Lord hears you in your distress. Then notice verse 17. Here he's in this teaching section. He's teaching uh, other Hebrews, he's teaching us uh, later uh, what to do because of the Lord's goodness and because of, of what he provides when we are in distress. Uh, no, we'll go, let's go back up to 15, actually, before we get into 17. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. And so David's saying, I can tell you this from a first-person perspective. Here's what God did to me. He heard me, and he delivered me. So then he says, you be sure, because the Lord is righteous, and because your goal, your life, desire is to be righteous, you cry out to the Lord, he will hear you, and he will deliver you. So he's teaching us that. Now, let's, important this no let's notice this important thing here. Okay, When David cries out for deliverance, when David is relying on the Lord, did his deliverance look to David like what David probably thought it should. Probably not. You know, David's not thinking necessarily, at least if he's human like us, that having to act like an insane person is the way for the Lord to be delivered from his enemies. And yet, that's what happened. That's what he had to do in order to get out of that situation. There's a lot of other fascinating parts of this story of David escaping from Saul that are not glamorous. They're not fun. They're not enjoyable. But yet, the Lord provided deliverance for David from this enemy Saul, from these other enemies like those in Gath. And so um, we have to pray for deliverance. We have to pray for the Lord's blessing. But we also have to have the courage to know that the Lord is bigger than us and sees more than us and that he will deliver us in ways that we may not understand and may not see and may not enjoy. But David shows us that that deliverance is possible because God hears us. Two other quick things to notice about this psalm before we wrap this up, okay? I want you to notice that uh, verses 12 through 14 are quoted in 1 Peter 3. So that's in the context of how we handle persecution, how the early church was told by Peter to handle persecution and mistreatment. And he goes back to this psalm because it's David in the midst of mistreatment. It's David in the midst of running from Saul, and he leans on this. Then also verse 20 is a uh, is this prophecy, a messianic portion of this psalm that was fulfilled with Jesus on the cross. Not a bone was broken of Jesus. He was crucified. He was hung on the cross. But the Lord still protected him by not breaking his bones. He was not totally mistreated. He was not completely torn to pieces. The Lord delivered his body wholly and safely. And that's what the picture that we have. The Lord will deliver us. It may not be like we like. It may not be how we like it. It may not be an enjoyable way. But it will be completely and totally deliverance, delivered from our enemies when we pray and lean upon God and ask him for deliverance. Now, just quickly, let me tell you this to be personal, okay? This has been a tough, uh, a different week for me, a lot of different stresses of this week, and um, nothing to complain about, I mean, nothing that's worth complaining about or, or, 
or crying about or getting upset about. But it's just been a stressful, stressful week uh, for me. And what I found is that sometimes I'm quick to pray. You know, that sometimes when I feel down, I feel out, I feel upset, I feel that stress kind of building up, I'm quick to pray. But then there are times when I'm quick to think through and, and try to solve my own problems. And, and while that may be natural, what does Paul say? Praying at all times in the spirit. What does David say? I will bless the Lord at all times. And so if I'm looking at this personally, I can see that in my own life, I pray. I think about talking to the Lord about these things. But I still have to work on praying at all times. There's still room for improvement for me to, to better fight the battles uh, that Satan is trying to, to hurl in my direction. And that's the same for you. That's the same for your children or grandchildren, whomever you love and are trying to help as well. So let's work on that, praying at all times. It doesn't mean the sky's going to open and all of a sudden our problems will be solved. But we have the confidence that the Lord hears our every cry at all times and that he will deliver and does deliver us from our enemies. So thanks for joining. I know this may have ended up being a little longer than uh, others and maybe that we intended, but hope that it blesses your day, hope that it blesses your weekend, and hope and pray that you will lean on the Lord and cry out and talk to him. Uh, if you need me for anything, please let me know. Joey Spark should be pretty easy to find here on Periscope and on Twitter. Um, any other way that, thanks Wes, uh, that, that you can find me, would love to hear from you in any way.